from 2 Thessalonians, Paul, Silas, and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians, in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace and peace to you from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We ought always to thank God for you, brothers and sisters, and rightly so, because your faith is growing more and more. And the love all of you have for one another is increasing. Therefore, among God's churches, we boast about your perseverance and faith in all the persecutions and trials you are enduring. I wanted to share that scripture because I know that right now we are undergoing some trials and we're enduring some things. Life is not normal. We're apart from each other. We're apart from those we love. It's a good reminder. Um, that even in that time, our faith can grow more and more. And the second passage is, with this in mind, we constantly pray for you that our God may make you worthy of his calling and that by his power, he may bring to fruition your every desire for goodness and your every good deed prompted by faith. We pray this so that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're going to see in my short comments today a good deed prompted by faith from, from someone in the scripture. So I want to start uh, the sermon in uh, Habakkuk chapter 1. Now I know Habakkuk is maybe not uh, a book that we read all that often, but there's a really great message in here for us, especially as we think about this time of trial that we are enduring. This is the message that was given to Habakkuk the prophet. Lord, I continue to ask for help. When will you listen? I cried to you about the violence, but you did nothing. People are stealing and hurting others. They're arguing and fighting. Why do you make me look at these terrible things? The law is weak and not fair to people. Evil people win against good people, so the law is no longer fair and justice does not win anymore. Habakkuk has some questions for God and some accusations about God. He says and he feels that he is very weary with the way that the world is right now. He's tired of the way the world is right now, and maybe we can relate to Habakkuk in those feelings. He has a couple of questions for God. Number one, how long is this going to last? How long am I going to cry out to you? How long do I say to you that I see violence and how long are you going to be silent? And the second question that he has for God is a question that a lot of us ask when we see bad things in the world, when we see injustice, when we see wrongdoing. A normal question for us to ask of God is, why? Why do you allow all these things, God? So how long and why? are questions that the prophet has for God. And even though these are questions that were posed long ago by an Israelite prophet that we don't even really read that book of the Bible so uh, very often, these are questions that we can relate to today. Share a story with you about my mom, who had a very painful pancreatic cancer. And she was diagnosed, first of all, with stomach cancer. And then when they went to look at it, to operate on it, they realized that she actually had pancreatic cancer and she was not able to be operated on. And I remember praying at that time these very things that Habakkuk was saying. Um, why is this happening? Why is this happening to my mom? And why, how long does she have to suffer? Because it was a very painful disease and she suffered for quite a long time with this cancer. 
And besides those questions that um, Habakkuk had about why and how long, he kind of blames God. He accuses God. He makes some statements about God to let God know that he's not happy with God. He says, God, you're not listening. You don't save. Justice is not happening on the earth. It's perverted, and it does not prevail. So besides asking God some very thought-provoking questions and wondering, he also sort of shakes his finger at God and says, hey, God, listen up. Uh, the world is not going the way you said it should be going. And these internal struggles that the prophet is leveling with God about, the questions and the accusations, they're even more intense for the prophet, be, not because he doesn't know God, not because God is mysterious and so far away and so unknown. The reason why the prophet is struggling so much, asking these very heartbreaking questions, is the opposite, because God is known to him. The prophet understands God's nature and God's character. He knows that God is holy and righteous. Now let's read from Exodus chapter 34, where God proclaims his name. It says, the Lord came down in the cloud and stood there with them and proclaimed his name, the Lord. He passed in front of Moses proclaiming, the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Yet, he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation. And next, how about Psalm chapter 1, where it says, the righteous are like trees planted by streams of water. They bear fruit in season. Whatever they do prospers. Not so the wicked. They are like chaff that the wind blows away. So I wanted to share those two passages because Habakkuk knew about the name of God that was proclaimed to Moses. Habakkuk knew about Psalm chapter 1, and both of those passages say that God holds people accountable. God punishes people. God does not like wrongdoing. God holds wrongdoers accountable. He seeks justice, and he says that the ones, just like we heard in our story about Daniel, the ones who are righteous and are doing right, they're like a tree planted by a stream of water. They prosper. And so Habakkuk is saying, hold on a minute, God. I don't think you're acting in according to what Scripture says about your nature. This is not making sense because you have said you are a God who punishes wickedness and rewards righteousness. And so the prophet is scratching his head just a little bit. Now, the Babylonians are mentioned in verse 6, and you think automatically those are the evil ones that God is talking about. But that's not so. God mentions the Babylonians because they are the ones that are going to come in and punish God's people. Just the opposite of what was said that we read in Scripture. It's the wicked ones who are going to come in and do the punishing. Habakkuk is struggling with the people being unrighteous that are in the, law, the house of Israel itself. So that's a little bit different take on what you normally read in prophecy. I love this um, quote that I found from this particular commentary. It's a little long, but I'd like to read it to you. It says, this 
unanswered prayer sets the tone for the entire book. Habakkuk faces the dilemma that has confronted faithful people in every age. The dilemma of seemingly unanswered prayer for the healing of society. The prophet is one with all those persons who fervently pray for peace in our world, but only experience war. Who pray for God's good to come on earth, but to only find evil. He's also one with every soul who has prayed for healing beside a sickbed, only to be confronted with death with every spouse who has prayed for love to come into a home and found only hatred and anger, and with every anxious person who has prayed for serenity but has been further disturbed and agitated. I really like that because we can relate to prayers that we have prayed for healing, for hope, for change, and it doesn't seem to be happening. Just this week, a good friend of mine in the Boy Scouts, their family had a tragic death of a 23-year-old daughter. It's hard to know why these evil things happen in the world, and we, along with Habakkuk, cry out, how long and why, and why don't you see this injustice? Well, what is God's answer? How does he answer Habakkuk's questions of why does this happen and how long? Are you going to put up with this? God, don't you care? Don't you see? So here's how God answers the prophet. He says, look at the nations and watch and be utterly amazed. For I'm going to do something in your days that you would not believe even if you were told. I'm going to raise up the Babylonians. The ruthless and impetuous people who sweep across the whole earth to seize dwellings not their own. God says, if I told you, you wouldn't even believe it. And you might have said that to your friend sometime. This experience was so amazing. I've got to tell you about it because the only reason I believe it is because I was there and I saw it myself. And I know you may not believe this. And that's what God says to the prophet. Even if I told you, you're not going to believe it, but I'm going to tell you anyway. And here is what you may not even believe. The Babylonians, yeah, those neighbors of yours that you don't like, that are evil, that are unrighteous, that are wicked, that are not following God's laws, those Babylonians, they're going to come in and seize dwellings, not their own. Who would expect that God would use a wicked instrument to judge a nation that is supposedly more righteous than them. And that's why God tells the prophet, hey, you're, you wouldn't believe this. You are going to be amazed because this is something that you would not expect. Further, the Lord says to Habakkuk, write down the revelation and make it plain on tablets so that a herald may run with it. For the revelation awaits an appointed time. It speaks of the end and will not prove false. Though it linger, wait for it. It will certainly come and will not delay. See, the enemy is puffed up. His desires are not upright. But the righteous person will live by faithfulness. So God tells Habakkuk, even in his unbelief about what God is going to do, that he should do a couple things. Number one, write this down. Even though you have, cannot fathom that an unrighteous and wicked nation is going to come in and be my instrument, you should write this down anyway. And you should let this be known all across the land. Have a courier, have a herald run with this news. And secondly, Habakkuk, you should wait. You should wait because you should know that God is at work and God's justice will come. And then the saying that is quoted throughout the New Testament and something that is very dear to us as Christians that we 
remind each other about in times like this, when times are hard, when life is difficult, when our prayers are not answered the way we want, when we cry out to God, how long? The answer is the righteous will live by faith. It takes faith to tell others about God, even when God seems to be acting in a way that isn't consistent with the way we think God should act. That was what Habakkuk was struggling with. Habakkuk thought he knew the way God should always act. And when God didn't do that, he leveled those accusations against God and questioned God. And so it takes faith to wait while it seems that God is not acting the way he should, or God is not caring about injustice. And it takes faith to wait while my prayers seem like they are not being answered the way that I want right now. I think an important concept that I've learned in my life about faith and doubt is that doubt is a part of our faith. The opposite of faith is not doubt. The opposite of faith is the ability to see. If we could see and know everything, we would not be a people living by faith and walking by faith. So no, doubt is not the opposite of faith. Doubt is an important part of our faith. And just like Habakkuk, what I want to encourage you today, church, with is if and when you have doubts about God's acting and working in the world, just like the prophet, you take those questions and that anger and that frustration to God because he's the only one that can answer those questions and do something about it. <clears throat> I want to finish with a story that we all know about a famous character in the New Testament named Zacchaeus. In Luke chapter 19, it says that Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through a town. A man there named Zacchaeus was a ruler among the tax collectors, and he was rich. He was trying to see who Jesus was, but being a short man, he, he couldn't because of the crowd. And so he ran ahead and climbed up a sycamore tree so he could see Jesus, who was about to pass that way. When Jesus came to the spot, he, he looked up and said, Zacchaeus, come down. I'm going to stay at your house today. And so Zacchaeus came down at once, happy to welcome Jesus. And everyone who saw this grumbled said, he's gone to be the guest of a sinner. Zacchaeus stopped and said, look, Lord, I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I've cheated anyone, I repay them four times as much. And Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this household because this man too is a son of Abraham. This is such a great story. We remember that a tax collector in this society would have been somebody who was despised and hated. Nobody liked the tax man, just like we don't like paying our taxes today. And not only just the regular tax man, but Zacchaeus, scripture says, was a chief tax collector. So he was likely in charge of a group of tax collectors. He was sort of like a manager. And it was his job to oversee probably a, a town or a region and there would be many roads going into the town. And his job was to make sure that customs or tolls were taken when people were coming in to buy and to sell. And scripture notes that not only was he an overseer or a manager, but he was wealthy. And that reveals that he was pretty good about collecting taxes. 
collecting not only what Rome required, but probably taking some for himself as well. And I want to suggest to you that Zacchaeus, this is exactly what Habakkuk is talking about. Zacchaeus is the type of guy that Habakkuk was complaining to God about. Here in real life, here in the flesh, is the real face of oppression and someone who was lording it over God's people, someone who was committing injustice. Here's somebody doing wrong, and he is unstopped and unchecked by God, and he is flaunting it in front of everybody because he is wealthy. And so all the people are wondering, like, hey, what's up with this guy? Just like Habakkuk. Hey, God, how long are these Romans going to rule us? Why aren't you doing anything about these Romans? And what about these so-called Jews like Zacchaeus who are taking our money and ripping us off? God, when are you going to do something about this? But at the call of Jesus, this one who has oppressed God's people, this one who is the face of injustice, this exploiter, he immediately responds to the Lord. And just like I love in this picture, all the people are muttering and complaining and watching this happen. And when Zacchaeus hears all of that muttering and complaining, he makes a pretty bold promise. He says, hey, hold on, I'm going to pay everybody back. And if I ripped anybody off, if, but he certainly did, he says he is going to pay it back fourfold. Well, this is exactly what God was talking about with the prophet Habakkuk. Remember, he told Habakkuk, you wouldn't believe it even if I told you. Zacchaeus, an oppressor, a guy who was a part of the problem, responding to the call of God? Wow. As we read in our scripture, by God's power, he's going to bring to fruition your every desire and you for a good deed that's prompted by faith. Even someone who isn't a believer, they, they can have a good deed that's prompted by a small amount of faith. And Zacchaeus, this man who was used to exploiting others and being the face of oppression, suddenly had this desire to do good. And so Jesus proclaimed him a son of the great man, who also lived by faith. And of course, that man is Abraham. In Hebrews 1, God called Abraham to travel to another place that he promised to give him. Abraham did not know where that other place was, but he obeyed God and started traveling because he had faith. And secondly, in Hebrews, it says, by faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice who he embraced the promises. He who embraced the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son. And so those are passages that we know well about the great man of faith, Abraham. And there's Jesus on that day, looking at a man who had oppressed and who had committed injustice, a person who all the people cried out to God, how long and why? And he was naming that man as a son of the great man of faith, Abraham. And so church, I want to challenge you to say that God is at work even when we don't see it or know it. Even when you and I are crying out to God, how long and why? And I don't see justice happening in the world. Just like the people who knew Zacchaeus, they surely didn't think that God was going to work in his life being a chief tax collector. They didn't see it or believe it. And they muttered 
about his responses to Jesus. But unlike Zacchaeus, who was walking by faith, they weren't. So why does God sometimes seem to linger? Why does he sometimes seem to tolerate injustice and oppression? Those are really great questions. We're running out of time, and I'm, I can't give all the answers for that because I do think that God has his own reasons. But I like to share Second Peter chapter 3. It says, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. And so if we can walk by faith also, we are going to see that God isn't taking a nap. He hasn't left his throne. He's not uncaring. He watches over us and he sees us. He's not slow. He is at work in our lives and in the lives of the Zacchaeuses around us as well.